Uh, my name is Eileen Corcoran. I'm the Community Outreach and Media Coordinator here at the Vermont Historical Society. Uh, so I'd like to welcome you all to our Vermont History Museum here in Montpelier. Uh, if you haven't been here before, um, we hope maybe you'll come back sometime and visit the museum itself. It's got a wonderful uh, exhibit that sort of spans the history of Vermont, as well as a couple of, of special exhibits. Uh, one we just opened recently is on Norman Rockwell and his time in Arlington, Vermont, so it's a fantastic exhibit uh, if you get a chance to come back and see that. Um, the Vermont Historical Society is a private nonprofit organization, and as such, we do rely on our members and donors to help support us. So we hope uh, if you enjoy this kind of program, if you enjoy visiting the museum, or you just want to support Vermont history and all that we do, um, pick up a membership form out front um, for more information on how you can be involved with the Vermont Historical Society. Uh, and so what has brought us here this afternoon uh, is this fantastic uh, donation that we received at the Historical Society. The Histor Historical Society has um, somewhere upwards of 20,000 objects in our care, uh, 50,000 or more pieces of archival material, um, and we're always uh, happy and excited when we get new material that really helps tell the story of Vermont. And so this piece um, that we received, which is a bacon banjo, um, really helps tell that story and is a fantastic uh, addition to our collection, and it sort of led us to this program today of wanting to bring in both a little bit of the history, uh, a little bit of music, and a little bit of sort of that music tradition today in Vermont, which we think is so important and so wonderful to see. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of background information on Fred Bacon and his time in Vermont, um, and then we'll have some wonderful music from our young musicians, um, and uh, we hope you enjoy. Uh, so Fred Bacon and the Bacon Banjo. So this is Fred Bacon, uh, circa 1901. Uh, Fred was born in 18... 71 in Holyoke, Massachusetts. Uh, he started playing the, bacon, uh, the banjo at a young age um, and sort of took to it uh, quite easily. Um, ended up studying with a banjo maestro called A.A. A. Farland, um, known as a progressive banjoist um, or more of a classical style banjo. So they would play not only the uh, sort of banjo music we might think of, but also polkas, waltzes, uh, any sort of classical composition that you could think of. Um, so the banjo of that time was a little bit different from the banjo that we think of today. Uh, and so Fred Bacon showed a real aptitude for the banjo and started touring. I uh, used to tour with sort of Wild West shows and medicine shows. Uh, he apparently toured with one uh, called Bronco John's Wild West show as Nebraska Fred, even though he's from Massachusetts. Um, and at one point was known as the Banjo Kid as well. So sort of getting into that, that bit of, of uh, life. And he, um, again, he said that the banjo is the greatest of musical instruments when it is played well. In tone quality is very much like the harp and its flexibility of playing is unexcelled for in the hands of a skilled player, it is as good for classical music as for dance tunes. And so he played all of that uh, throughout the United States and more. Uh, eventually becoming a great solo performer as well as with quintets, small groups, and including his wife Cassie, uh, who he married in 1897. Uh, and some of his work uh, did include getting uh, recordings uh, with the Victor uh, Company and Edison. Um, and we have a couple for you today. Uh, so the first one is the West Lawn Polka. <laughs> Thank you. 
um, performance. And this is one, uh, it's called um, Southern Medley, Southern Airs Medley. Uh, another one, this is made for the Edison. Um, it's actually from a cylinder recording, so it's a little bit uh, more. Yes, right now, right? So 1912, so however many years we want to, uh, over 100 years ago. We've been and the familiar old home medleys, always dear to his heart. Uh, and so part of um, how uh, he came to Vermont uh, was because a little bit of this uh, horseshoe patent that he had. Uh, and so he apparently patented uh, a horseshoe sort of leather covering uh, to use on ice and snow uh, and sold the rights to that for $10,000. Um, which uh, obviously in sort of the early 1900s was a, a nice chunk of money, uh, and used that money to build a house in Forestdale, Vermont, which is a village within Brandon. And that's what brought him up here uh, to start the Bacon Banjo Company. Uh, and he first patented uh, his internal resonator banjo in 1906. Um, and this was sort of known, um, let's see what it's called, a mellower, richer, and a greater complexity and presence uh, than other banjos. And Bacon said, the principal objection to the banjo resides in the fact that the tones are of short duration and that they therefore have a sharp staccato quality which is objectionable. The object of this invention is to overcome this objection by providing the rim with a peculiarly constructed annular chamber within which the partially, partly confined air can vibrate in harmony with the strings and cooperative, cooperate therewith to produce a strong and resonant tone. Uh, and so he started the Forestdale factory sort of in that early 1900s. The first mention is around 1906, but the company was not actually incorporated to about 1912 officially. Uh, and this is a photograph uh, from outside the factory uh, in Forestdale, circa 1913. Uh, and Bacon is the one kind of in the center um, with the hat on, one of the banjos. Uh, and this is sort of the inside of the factory. Um, we're unsure um, whether the, the banjos were fully made. It's most likely that they contracted some of the pieces out from other companies, most likely Vega in Boston, and just assembled the banjos in uh, Brandon rather than making them fully on site. Um, but again, some of those are you know, sort of a, little, a little hard to tell uh, exactly what, what, was, what was made there versus what was just finished or assembled there. Um, and all of these original new banjos were five strings. Uh, the Bacon Company and the Bacon and Day Company are known more for later banjos, which were four-string tanger banjos, but these, like this, uh, were five-string banjos. Um, and they were sort of thought of as well-made uh, banjos, but some folks um, didn't think there was high caliber. Uh, a Bacon contemporary called Cliff Spaulding uh, referred to them as axe-handle banjos. Um, or shoe polish banjos, so perhaps did not think of them as high quality as some of the others, um, but Bacon himself 
uh, thought they were very fine instruments and was very uh, proud of sort of the, the marketing uh, thereof. Uh, so in the Bacon Professional Catalog, this is banjo number one, um, which is what we have uh, in our collection now. It was the least expensive uh, version, so it went for $40. Uh, still a fairly uh, decent amount of money. Um, but his uh, highest level, the, I think it's the grand, special grand concert banjo went for $125, uh, which had white holly veneer, ebonized holly, and rock maple. Those are some of the, the great parts about the bacon banjo. Uh, this is one of his advertisements. Why is it two thirds of the leading teachers play the bacon banjo? Uh, he, was a, he was a salesman and he knew how to sell his banjos and himself. Um, because the bacon banjo was the best of, in every way. And certainly a bacon, first lasted forever. Um, you get a week's trial, you can get these done, and it was a fantastic uh, work that he did uh, for that. And this was, you know, also in his uh, catalog, the things that he felt distinguished the bacon banjo from all the other banjos you could get out there. Um, perfect adjustment, thoroughly seasoned Vermont maple wood, uh, made by skilled workmen, uh, personally tested by Mr. Bacon himself, very important. <laughs> Uh, the Flutie Sound, again, his patented sounding chamber, uh, and the most magnificently finished uh, aspect. And again, another one of his uh, advertisements. You know, read carefully these notices. I love this one. Get in a good quiet corner and do a little hard thinking before you place your order for a new banjo. So when you were thinking about some other banjo, read these testimonials, and then really think hard if you want to get anything other than bacon banjo, you're going to want to get banjo. Um, and, and again, it was definitely one of those things where, it's starting in 1906, soon 19, um, 14 or 15 is the only time he was in Forestdale, Vermont. And basically, the, he got successful in making banjos uh, and decided to move uh, to Connecticut. Um, so in Groton, Connecticut, started his factory after that. Uh, so they moved out of uh, Brandon, Vermont, and moved to summer in Newfane, Vermont. So they still had a Vermont connection, but they were no longer manufacturing banjos in the state. Um, and a lot of folks do know the later banjos, so the banjos starting around 1915 that come from Connecticut, and then later what became the Bacon and Day Banjo Company uh, in sort of the 20s and 30s. Um, and then basically the hurricane destroyed the factory in 1938. Uh, and that's when Fred Bacon uh, sort of got out of the banjo business. Uh, but he officially retired to Vermont. Um, you know, a little bit after that, his wife Cassie, his first wife Cassie died in 1936. Uh, and then he sort of, they moved to Newfane full time and sort of became a part of that community. So uh, he actually, during the Great Depression, uh, worked for the WPA. Uh, teaching music and sharing music in Vermont. Um, he sort of at one point in time uh, worked to demonstrate that the average citizen of the Green Mountain State could be taught to play some instrument and thereby acquire a worthwhile hobby. So I think it's all great for us that we should require you know, a worthwhile hobby. Um, and then he ended up passing away in uh, 1948. So. Uh, that's a little bit about Fred Bacon and sort of his time in Vermont. Um, and we just want to say a few thank yous. Uh, first to Paul Heller, who donated the banjo to the Vermont Historical Society. Uh, that's wonderful. Young Tradition Vermont and Mark Sustick for here. Uh, Cedars Instruments, who um, restored the banjo for us uh, as well. Um, and I'd also like to thank our musicians. We're going to turn it over to them um, to have some lovely banjo music. Uh, I don't know who would like to uh, start. Any, anyone? I'm can, we, pick on someone. can we all go up there? You can all come up. Yes, please do. Great idea. <laughs> and I'll just have you introduce yourselves uh, real quickly. And uh, we'll go from there. So start with me. Um, my name is Uma Peters. I'm 12 years old. My name is Lula Zykan. I'm 21 years old and I'm from Northfield, Vermont. I'm Carlin Burkhout. I'm 21 years old from Bennington, Vermont. 
so I don't know if anyone would like to start with a little uh, music and or start with a little playing of the bacon banjo. Well, Uwe, you're sitting closest to me, so I'm going to pick on you. So, um, and I'm actually going to sort of hold the mic a little bit for you. Uh, so, can you talk just a little bit about what brought you to playing the banjo? Um, well, I first saw Rihanna Giddens when she was part Sorry, of... we can't hear a thing. Is that the mic on This one's up for the, just the video, so can you speak up some? Uh, I first started... Well, I first saw the banjo seeing Rhiannon Giddens when she was still with the Carolina Chocolate Drops. She's a, an amazing banjo player. She just played the Newport Folk Festival, and she does a lot about the history of the banjo and going back and teaching people about that and playing some of those songs. Mm -hmm. Want to play something for us? I'm going to play you guys um, a minstrel melody that were some of the original songs that came from Africa. And although I usually play these on my gourd banjo, which was the original banjo, um, I can't travel with it, so I retuned my banjo to that tune.
speak up too, but I know I'd make them all yell. Our other mic is not working, unfortunately. So. Okay. So you can kind of speak into that, speak out to those folks. Yeah, uh, so I started playing the banjo, uh, learning from uh, Ted Ingham of Montpelier. He uh, teaches a lot of classes around here, and he's a great teacher. I love him. And uh, I guess I'll play uh, a song now. Uh, it's called Don't Let Your Deal Go Down, and I learned it from Ted. Um, and you'll get to see how all the, how the different banjos sound.
play in a duo called Carling and Will. Uh, we started with sort of a bunch of like, traditional fiddle tunes and then over the years started writing uh, our own music. Uh, the Will Mosheim is actually who I play with who uh, fixed up this banjo and also built this banjo. Um, so I think I'll start with uh, a song that we wrote uh, titled Mulberry Sky.
so one thing I didn't realize uh, is that I didn't ask you guys about your instrument. So you mentioned that yours is built um, by Will. Um, so yeah, do you want to each talk a little bit about what instruments you have or play and sort of why, why you're playing those, those banjos? So Carly, yeah, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit more yeah, about yours. Yeah, so this was um, built by Will. Uh, his business is called Cedars Instruments. Um, he primarily builds custom banjos. Um, this one in particular, uh, I play for it for a number of reasons. Um, one, it's a 12-inch pot, which is a little bit larger than uh, like a standard banjo. They're usually 11 inches. Um, that sort of emphasizes more of the uh, low end, um, and so it's a little bassier, um, which I particularly like, and I, I tend to tune down to B flat, um, so I have a low tuning as well. Um, so the the size of, of the head, as well as something called the Dobson tone ring, which tends to have a, a warmer sound, um, and also the walnut wood all kind of uh, emphasize this uh, mellow and warmer sound to the banjo, which I particularly like. Yeah, this banjo is uh, made by a man named Nate Calkins, who lives near Portland, Oregon. And um, I definitely don't have a lot to say about it. <laughs> it just seems like the right thing at the right time, so that's how I have it. Um, mine is an old banjo, and it was custom made for me. And, well, I, it's a certain style that I really like. Uh, so we'd love to have you guys play a little bit of uh, Bacon Banjo, since it has been uh, restored. I don't know if anyone would like to, to start or to do it. Sure. And I will say I'm sure it won't be quite as uh, well played as their own instruments, but I think it's a fun little thing.
take questions. Does anybody have any questions uh, for either our lovely Vander players or about Fred Bacon and the Bacon Baker Joe? Yeah. Is it hard to learn the um, banjo and the guitar? Ooh. So you all play <laughs> the guitar. You all just play the banjo. I I play guitar too, but I feel like I mean they're they're very different. Um, I find that the, the fretboard of the guitar is like more difficult to kind of understand, and there's there's more going on, at least in my experience. More with strings. It. Yeah, more strings, <laughs> exactly. Um, but they're do I'm, I'm sure it also it depends on how you approach both, but, yeah. Yes? Uh, do you clog or tap dance to it? I would love to learn Appalachian clogging, but I have not done that yet. <laughs> I'm curious about, um, so at the time, like in the early 100s, like, what kind of music were people playing with these banjos? Um, and who was, was playing them? Yeah, and so, um, and Paul, you can sort of help with anything that I'm missing. Um, so that early part, again, it was both, uh, so a lot of music that did come from the minstrel shows. So, and that's sort of, what we would say the, um, the, the white people's introduction to the banjo was to the yeah. minstrel. Um, but it sort of took off into more again sort of that classical style. So they would be playing both things like polkas and waltzes, and, and I believe sort of a different playing style even with the classical um, banjo, as well as sort of still playing minstrel tunes, still playing some of those, you know, the Stephen Fosters and, the, and that, that kind of traditional style. And so you can see folks, they used to apparently have banjo clubs at universities. So you could belong to the banjo club. Uh, and so it was much more, you know, sort of Victorian parlor, you would see a lot of folks. So it became sort of this mix of sort of both a, a I don't say a higher end type of instrument, but it certainly wasn't thought of as only a more sort of rural or affirmation of bluegrass style instrument. It was definitely thought of as um, sort of a, a real classical style instrument. You could have banjo quintets, and you could have all these groups that would play the banjo in that, in that way. Oh, I don't think anything else. Uh, uh, one thing I would say is that um, <clears throat> the classical banjo style often played from scores, written music, un unlike mm. folk music banjo. Yeah. The, um, did I hear you right that that was the original number one serial number, or was it an example of it? It's an example of the number one. So yeah, so it is one of the, the number one banjos. Um, so made sort of that circa, I believe, 1910, 1912 uh, time frame in Vermont. So it is one of the Vermont banjos, um, which again, because the banjo factory was only here for about half a dozen years or so, um, they tend to be a little bit rarer. And because uh, his later banjos were sort of more well-known banjos, I would say, or sort of uh, more popular banjos. And, and our, your brother and sister? Who else in the family plays? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how did you start to play the banjo, particularly? You, you, I mean, you talked a little bit about your and yeah, um, yeah. But was, did you did you play any other instruments before that, or? Uh, yeah, I started on the classical violin when mm -hmm. I was four, and then when Gary started doing more of the bluegrass old time kind of feeling. And I got interested in that too. And then I wanted to play another instrument. So at first I was looking at guitar, and then I saw a ring, and so I decided to play the Yeah. Okay. So do they? Sorry. The hockey dog. Do you guys tour, or is this how? We, what? What are you? Where are you guys going with this? Uh, yeah, we play. Um, we play more shows during the summer, sure, because we still go to school in Nashville. Um, but yeah, we're, we're here for a festival in Burlington, actually. Yeah. yeah, and we, uh, we did have another player, who was supposed to be here today with us, who was another Vermont banjo player. Uh, she unfortunately uh, ended up having a little accident. Um, so we were super excited that um, Uma, especially was in town, was able to come over uh, and play with us. So that's a, a special treat. For us. And I do believe you guys, I heard you guys just have an album out. Is that true? 
Yeah, so there you go. Like today, <laughs> like you're out. Yeah. Yes, would it be possible? Would you feel comfortable paying with your brother uh, with a with a vacant banjo, maybe a portion of that last yeah. one that you just did, <laughs> just so I could listen to the difference? Yeah. Yeah. Would, would that be all right? <laughs> <laughs> That'd be good. Thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs>
another closed water berry, I'm safe.
here if you'd like to take a closer look at the bacon banjo, uh, get a chance to, to sort of look at the back a little bit and, and see a little bit more about this instrument, or obviously uh, if these ladies want to take any other questions or talk a little bit more about their banjos. Um, but I thank you all for coming today. Uh, it's been a wonderful, fun afternoon. So uh, I've had a lot of enjoyment uh, listening uh, to these ladies as well. So thank you again for coming. Uh, so.